The one time the city of Singapore is ever a truly quiet place is early on a Sunday morning. No traffic, no construction noise, no handphones. Just empty streets and the beauty of a rare tranquility. It's not a sight many of us see because we're all still tucked up in bed. Not me. In case you've forgotten, I'm Julian Davison. And we're here today to consider an interesting square kilometre or so that stretches back from Beach Road and is roughly bordered by Braspasser on one side and Camp on Glam on the other. It's an area that I feel, historically speaking, is too often overlooked. And right across the road is a familiar landmark. Our starting point for a stroll through one of modern Singapore's earliest areas of settlement. This could well have been the view in 1819 from where Raffles Hotel now stands, when Stamford Raffles was planning the layout of the settlement, which he'd acquired on behalf of the British East India Company. The road along the coast had been called, rather predictably, Beach Road, for the simple reason that it ran along what was the beachfront at the time. Obviously, Raffles hadn't done his homework properly when he designated Beach Road as the place where ships would offload their cargo. The sea was too shallow and often too rough for such a tricky undertaking. Cargo handling was shifted towards the mouth of the Singapore River and this proved to be a far more practical location. So, although Raffles had a lot of very good ideas as regards the development of early Singapore, unloading ships at Beach Road clearly wasn't one of them. As a consequence, Beach Road became one of the settlement's first prestigious residential streets. Chinese immigrants called it the Street of Twenty Houses, for indeed there soon were. Magnificent seafront bungalows and the corner house there, right next to the Raffles Institution, was eventually to become the first Raffles Hotel. Nothing grand at the time, that was to come later, and would occupy the exact same site. As the settlement gradually moved inland, many of the large bungalows became hotels or boarding houses. Then most vanished as the whole area began to become more densely populated, changing character along the way from upper class to middle class. A mid-19th century land reclamation project created two sides to build upon in Beach Road, providing room for the police station, the Alhambra and Marlborough cinemas, and a number of military structures, amongst which was the Singapore Volunteer Corps headquarters. Formed in 1854, the Singapore Volunteer Corps was an auxiliary military force comprising Malay, Chinese and Eurasian units under mainly British officers. And they were billeted there. It was disbanded in 1922 and the units were absorbed into the newly created Strait Settlements Volunteer Force. Fifteen years later, they were provided with a much more impressive home. It has survived war and occupation, but it may not survive the peace. Admittedly, it has for well over half a century, but it sits upon a prime and valuable strip of real estate, and it's been unoccupied for many years. The temptation to replace it with yet another generic office block or condominium might well prove irresistible. Moving along, directly ahead of me is the junction of Beach Road with Middle Road. And over there is the old Alhambra Cinema, highly regarded in its day, but totally unsuitable for the 21st century. While I regret the passing of many an old building, I can't really say I mourn the Alhambra. Not much architectural merit there. Today, Shaw Towers stands on the site and that of the Marlborough Cinema next door. I do, however, very much regret what has happened directly opposite in Liang Xia Street. The street is almost perfectly preserved in terms of its original shop houses, except for the two corners, and there's certainly no improvement over what originally stood there. Had the two street corners been preserved, then this would have been absolutely a magnificent thoroughfare. Another magnificent thoroughfare was nearby Middle Road. However, there's now nothing at all along its north side that appears to predate the 1970s. On the south side, only two shop houses remain along the entire length of the significantly reinvented middle road. They once enjoyed a modest fame, but I'm sure Julian will get to that story shortly. I will indeed, but first let's turn our attention to another story. A bit further down Beach Road, one comes to 
two large areas of parkland bordered by Tan Kui Lan Street and Ophir Road. They would originally have been occupied by a couple of luxurious colonial bungalows. That would have been in the early days of the settlement, say 170 years ago. But then move the clock forward 100 years, and you would find that by this time, the whole area would have been built over with as many as 400 Chinese shop houses occupying the same site. One can only guess at how many people were crammed into this low-rise labyrinth of living space. A figure of four or 5,000 certainly wouldn't surprise me. Um, back there is the seventh-story hotel on Rocha Road, standing remarkably tall amongst a veritable sea of shop houses. But today, it's rather insignificant in times when skyscrapers have grown much, much taller. It's that building from Batman's Gotham City that dominates an entirely different 21st century cityscape, the imposing Parkview Square. Whilst I venture a block further down Beach Road, we'll take a break and you can catch up with me in a few minutes, all right? Well, I must confess we've strayed a bit beyond this week's area of investigation and I've crossed the boundary into Kampong Glam, but I just wanted to check out whether another location had survived the march of time. And it has, the St John's Ambulance Building. But hang on a minute. One, two, three. It seems to have grown a bit. Clearly that's another story. Ah, oh, yes, just as I suspected. A little bit shorter back then but otherwise pretty much as I remember it. Clearly St John must have had a hand in protecting this austere but pleasant little building. I can't really decide whether or not I like the gateway towers, which are just down the road a piece from St John's. Certainly the knife edge corners are pretty impressive, but the stripey effect, a bit like Legoland, whatever. There are great improvements on what previously stood on the corner site. It was the Beach Road Market, which was basically a long, squat and hot tin shed. An unlovely structure whose passing shall go unmourned. But what was once behind the shed was far more intriguing. After the first mid-19th century land reclamation, the sea once lapped up against the rear of the market. And long before even the market was built, there was a set of stone steps that led down to the water at high tide. This was the departure point over a century ago for a succession of small boats that ferried passengers down to beachfront residences and hotels in Katong. The motor car was yet to arrive and roads in that direction were few, so sea transport was the practical way to go. Local residents referred to this sea taxi hub as Hailam Kongsi, mainly because Chinese immigrants from Hainan were at the time an integral part of business and commerce in this particular neighborhood, and remain so throughout Singapore's colonial interlude. Though no longer quite so staunchly Hainanese today, the area still bears witness to their influence and heritage. Just 200 meters away from here on Beach Road was, and still is, the headquarters of the Hainanese people in Singapore. Follow me. Back in 1857, the Hainanese originally established their local association in Malabar Street. And it wasn't until 1880 that they moved to this Beach Road location. In 1963, they replaced their more modest headquarters with the splendid Keng Chu building, which remains today a striking piece of architecture. And I'm reliably informed that there's a remarkable piece of history hidden away inside here. The association was set up to care for the physical and spiritual needs of the local Hainanese fishing community, who settled in the area shortly after the arrival of Raffles in 1819. Right from the start, they shared their premises with the Tin Ho Keng, Goddess of Mercy Temple. And this is what Julian's on his way to see. Certainly a long walk, but at the end of it, we find the original Beach Road Temple. Still looking much like it would have a hundred years ago. At the rear of today's building still stands the original temple structure and it was an admirable idea to retain it. 
An excellent example of thoughtful preservation and the Hainanese Association should be thoroughly congratulated. Well done indeed. Just a hundred meters away behind the temple are the shop houses we previously took a brief look at. They apparently not only reflect architectural, but culinary heritage as well. And here's the reason. The last two surviving shop houses in Middle Road, mentioned earlier, are reputed to have been Singapore's first Hainanese chicken rice outlet. And as one might expect, the Hainanese have a street named after them nearby. And here it is, Hailam Street. As little as 20 years ago, it was a fascinating place, adjoining as it did the infamous Malay Street. And it was here that ladies of all races and ages sold personal favours to gentlemen also of all races and ages. The streets are still there in a manner of speaking, but what's on sale today has changed considerably. Both streets were incorporated into the Bugis Junction shopping complex. When the place opened in 1996, they were heralded as Singapore's first air-conditioned streets. It's a really startling concept, but at least we didn't lose them in their entirety. But whereas the street plan might have been loosely maintained, the shop houses lining Bugis, Hailam, Malay and Malabar streets were not. Admittedly, what replaced them was a sincere and practical attempt to recreate the past. However, the fact is, not a single brick remains of what once originally occupied this entire historical city block. It's rather a pity that just a couple of the original buildings couldn't have been incorporated into this attractive complex to provide future generations with a sense of historical continuity. But perhaps prevailing wisdom was that what went on here was best forgotten. Admittedly, the old Bugis Street may not have been everybody's cup of tea, but I personally have rather good memories of that nefarious location. It was uh, August 1978 and the American Navy was in town. The aircraft carrier USS Enterprise, no less. I may not know this, but the American Navy is actually a dry fleet, which is to say not a drop of alcohol is allowed on their ships. Well, you can imagine what happens when thirsty American sailors get into town. They make a beeline for Boogie Street, or Boogie Street as they like to call it. And of course, the whole world was there to meet them. Every hustler, every con man, every good time girl, and a lot of girls who, quite frankly, weren't girls at all. They just wanted to meet those thirsty American sailors. And of course, an awful lot of liquid refreshment went down their throats, and I'm not talking orange juice. Anyway, I have to say, it was probably one of the best parties I've ever been to, like something out of a movie. And it went on all night. No, I'm afraid today's Booger Street is but a pale reflection. You should have been there. Perhaps you were. The city block that was once home to Booger Street is now home to, amongst others, the plush and prominent Hotel Intercontinental. Though it clearly offers superior accommodation to what was available in the neighbourhood 20 years ago, Julian's off across the road and back into the past to check out the competition. The new National Library is being built directly opposite, but previously the four-storey Empress Hotel occupied the corner site. The Empress was no five-star hotel, nor was she an architectural masterpiece. So like 95% of the rest of Middle Road, she was demolished and forgotten. But before her abdication, a couple of photos were taken from her upper floor, which you might find interesting. The Empress overlooked what is now the Hotel Incontinental, and this is what the view was like in 1985. Not all that long ago, depending of course on how old you are. Now down there on the left is most likely Malabar Street, which ran parallel to Highland Street. And if we go a little further across, we can see Northbridge Road, and already there's a large and unsightly concrete box that's gobbled up a dozen shop houses. The first of many large and unsightly concrete boxes, I'm afraid. Take a closer look at the corner of Northbridge Road and Middle Road and say goodbye to the Munn Dispensary. Now you see it, now you don't. Yet another large concrete and glass box has swallowed it up. 
Although Boogie Street had effectively ceased to exist, an attempt was made to preserve its spirit across the road. Shifted and sanitized, its lively and perverse charm didn't survive the transplant operation. Boogus Village is admittedly a very busy and very successful conglomeration of stalls, shops and food outlets, and undeniably a popular place to visit. But to in any way connect it to the Boogus Street of the past would require a quantum leap of the imagination. Right, Julian? Instead of forbidden fruit, we have forbidding fruit. Durian. And the only saucy surprise is left are the sambal dishes at the food court? Time we said goodbye to Booger Street, because even here at Booger's Village, potential heritage sites also aren't faring too well. Just outside the food court, the delightful police booth from those distant days before electronic road pricing has gone, replaced recently by an alfresco dining area. Maybe someone took it for their back garden. Or better still, it ended up in a police museum. I hope so. Speciality shopping streets were very much a feature of my childhood. In those days, if you wanted furniture, you went to Hill Street. For jewellery, it was the High Street. And here in Middle Road, well, there was no business like shoe business. I often came here with my mother when I needed a new pair of shoes. And back then, there were shoe shops literally everywhere. Today, you'd be hard-pressed to find a single one. The last interesting group of buildings opposite Princep Street was demolished 10 or 15 years ago. So in an historical sense, Middle Road has now become rather empty. Fortunately, historical churches have a far higher survival rate than historical streets. And just down Princep Street is the site of one of our very oldest churches. With the single exception of the Armenian church in Hill Street, this is the site of the oldest ecclesiastical building in Singapore. The Malay Mission Chapel was built here in 1843 at the behest of an Indian-born Englishman, the Reverend Benjamin Peach Keysbury, a gentleman ahead of his time in his all-embracing multiracial and multicultural attitudes. The London Missionary Society, which had established the church, maintained a close relationship with the Presbyterian Church in Orchard Road. And before the century was out, the Malay Mission Chapel had become the Straight Chinese Presbyterian Church. The church that we see here today was built in 1930, and the foundation stone was laid by none other than Sasong Ong Xian. This worthy gentleman and scholar was also, I might add, the author of a definitive and enduring historical record, namely a book entitled A Hundred Years of History of the Chinese in Singapore, which remains an invaluable source of reference even today. Directly alongside the Presbyterian Church is a pre-war housing estate, and I suspect that Julian's not going to be entirely happy with what's going on here. The tenants have moved out, and the demolition teams are about to move in. They're already hard at work next door. Well, that's a great shame, because these are a really wonderful example of early modernist architecture. They were probably built by the uh, SIT, that's the Singapore Improvement Trust, just after the Second World War. And they're actually quite like the flats down at Tiong Bahru. But that doesn't mean to say that we can afford to do away with them. We really shouldn't keep on whittling away at our architectural heritage until we only have one representative example of everything left. I know we've got Empress Place and the Houses of Parliament, St Joseph's. That's fantastic, great, I really approve of all that. But imagine if you went to London and there was only Buckingham Palace, the Houses of Parliament and Westminster Abbey. It'd be a little strange, wouldn't it? The entire area around Princep Street, Short Street and Albert Street is being demolished. However, it must be admitted that with the exception of the SIT estate, this was never a particularly attractive neighbourhood. Not so long ago, Albert Street was where motorists would come in search of spare parts and pretty much anything to do with cars or motorcycles. 
The dealers have long been dispersed and the shops and buildings stand silent, shuttered and empty. The shop houses along Saligi Road vanished along with those in Middle Road and only a small cluster towards Mackenzie Road are hanging on. Those directly opposite them weren't so lucky and didn't see out the 20th century. Over a hundred Saligi Road shop houses have been reduced to perhaps a dozen. Fortunately, the splendid Ellison building on the corner of Saligi and Bukatima roads is still with us, although some of its long-standing tenants appear to have moved on. Well, I was going to drop by the former colonial bar for an iced lemon tea, but I see that even its successor, the INR Food and Cafe House, has gone into terminal decline. So whilst I go and look for somewhere else, why don't you take a look and see what's on next week's programme? Julian hasn't had a decent curry for a while, and where better to find one than Little India? In next week's programme, Buffalo Carts and Swampy Parts, we're not only off down Srangoon Road, but we're taking a few surprising side trips as well. You mightn't remember the Bidadari Cemetery, but you will remember the old Kandankabau Hospital, and Srangoon Road's only the start. But we'd better get back across the canal to the Ellison Building. You may recall that I spoke about the Colonial Bar in the last series, so named because of the British gentleman who used to go up on the roof and watch the racing at Farrow Park. Well, it seems that the bar, like the race course, has long since gone. But this is not such a bad substitute. The Saligi 213 still has a delightfully old-fashioned feel to it with chairs and tables out on the pavement, which is more than can be said for a lot of what we've seen in this week's programme. However, I'm reliably informed that next week, when we cross over the Rocha Canal, we're going to find that a lot more has survived. And that's a story I'd like to believe. In the meantime, cheers. Clearly, unloading ships wasn't one. No, sorry, I got it. Scott Beach Road. You're away. Sorry, I can't get it out straight. Alama. We're here for today to consider an interesting square kilometre that stretches back which is more than can be said for what... Oh, sorry, I'm not doing... I'm running out of steam. Back then... No, sorry. Oh, those days. Sorry. Admittedly, the old Boogie Street wasn't everybody's... Oh, Christ. <laughs> <laughs>